tonight. First, Yellowknife, now Kelowna. Thousands of Canadians are on the run as wildfires threaten their communities. And something borrowed? This wedding dress has been passed down through five generations. Plus, women who love wild weather, a community of female storm chasers forms on the prairies. This is CBC Saskatchewan News. It's Friday, August 18th. CBC Saskatchewan News starts right now. Hello, I'm Natasha Lipney. Thank you for joining us. A fast-moving wildfire has forced thousands of people from their homes in the south-central interior of British Columbia. A state of emergency is in place for Kelowna, West Kelowna, and the nearby West Bank First Nation. A number of buildings have been destroyed, but there are no reports of injuries as of yet. CBC's Jessica Chung has the latest. An orange glow cloaked the night sky as a raging wildfire could be seen last night pushing over the ridge heading toward a community in West Kelowna. The fire grew from 64 hectares to more than 6,500 in just 24 hours, spreading to the other side of Okanagan Lake, starting spot fires in Kelowna proper. Somebody described it to me last night in the heat of the battle as it was like 100 years of firefighting all at once in one night. And I really think that it it was true. Officials are still assessing the damage, but confirm structures have been destroyed in West Kelowna. We knew that it was going to be bad. I think I said that yesterday uh, to the media. Um, you know, but this is what we plan for and this is what we practice for. But it was exponentially worse uh, than we had expected. Wow. Oh my God. Air crews are still battling the fire from above. Flights have been cancelled at Kelowna International Airport to make way for aerial firefighting. Thousands of people remain out of their homes and thousands more are on evacuation alert. I've talked to lots of people here last night that lost their homes. You know, I've lived in Kelowna for 15 years, but there's been fire, but nothing like this. This is horrendous. It's frightening. Officials are urging residents to leave their homes if an order has been issued. We have responded to calls of an un unauthorized persons within evacuated locations. It will remain a priority for our RCMP officers to ensure security in those areas that have been evacuated. And they will be doing this through roadblocks and roving patrols. With the fire still burning, crews brace for what could be another difficult night. Jessica Chung, CBC News, Vancouver. Meanwhile, in the Northwest Territories, firefighting efforts have held back the flames threatening the capital, but the fire could still reach Yellowknife this weekend. A deadline to evacuate the city passed at noon today, and some people are still waiting to get out by air. Regretfully, we, we didn't get the chance to, to embark, so hopefully today we will. It's scary. I keep crying. <laughs> I don't even know how long we're going to be away. Around 1,500 people were airlifted out of the city yesterday. There are at least 21 flights planned for today, 18 of them commercial. The Canadian forces will also be flying three jets out of the city. The airlift today is aiming to carry out about 2,000 people. While most residents have already left Yellowknife, many by road, they are arriving in Alberta towns such as Valley View. The CBC's Madeline Cummings was there to hear their stories. Valley View, Alberta is yet another stop on the long journey from Yellowknife. Evacuees have been coming to this small town arena since yesterday afternoon. 130 people had checked in as of last night. Here they can find food vouchers, a cup of coffee, and if they're lucky, a hotel room. Some are finding shelter in town, but others are being told to move on to Edmonton because there's just not enough room. Like this convoy of families from Yellowknife. For many, with more than a thousand kilometers traveled, exhaustion is setting in. Yusuf Al Shayab's car broke down in high level and he's barely slept. The condition now very, very, very difficult because no, no place, no job, and my wife is pregnant. But there's also a sense of relief. When we got to high levels, when we got there, okay, we are, we are safe, <laughs> we are happy. I told him we just need to cross the fires, you know, 
to cross the limits and then after that no problem we can we can sleep in the street no problem you know <laughs> because life is everything <laughs> Just before these families left to drive to Edmonton, the local Dairy Queen's manager came by and passed out ice cream bars to everybody. That brought a smile on the kids' faces, and the adults were happy too to have a snack before getting back in the car. Madeline Cummings, CBC News, Valley View, Alberta. Some of the people fleeing the fires are finding it difficult to see and share information online the way they used to. One of the reasons is Facebook and Instagram's parent company, Meta, is blocking users from posting Canadian news. As Anise Hadari explains, not getting enough information or the right information can be dangerous. Trying to get news about the fires can be frustrating for evacuees. A lot of the time, that's how I read my news. So if I am missing all these news outlets are like, oh, oh, yeah, there is definitely something missing on Facebook. If we can't share accurate news on one of the biggest social media platforms that we have available to us, it, it is very dangerous. As fires burn near Yellowknife, many news articles are blocked on Meta's platforms. Many in the north have noticed and many have complained. Meta is blocking news in response to a federal law that could force the companies to pay outlets including CBC, for news links. I would really like Facebook to pay the bill and get the news back on. Many people use screenshot pictures to sneak local news past the block. So Lord bless people for taking the time to do that when Meta's making it so hard. In a statement, the federal government said Meta is being irresponsible. They've had that drop in the... Researchers uh, say the same. Facebook is not... Uh, delivering the service that people need. And you can argue back and forth about the bill itself uh, that's underlying this. But I think at the core is right now, uh, it's an emergency and citizens need access to information. What Meta needs to realize is and that- And advocates say Meta can't just walk away from news. This is a company that spent more than a decade integrating itself into the news um, production and dissemination system. Like it or not, they're a part of how news is shared across the globe, including in Canada. Meta has said Canadians can access news outlets directly by downloading mobile news apps or going to websites. But when asked if it would unblock news because of the extreme situation in the Northwest Territories, the company didn't answer. Anise Hidari, CBC News, Calgary. News organizations of all sizes are feeling the hits from the recent fallout between Meta and the Canadian government. One small Saskatchewan publisher says the government was too aggressive with its terms in Bill C-18. I feel it's it's unnecessary. I feel this this is, isn't our fight. Um, I feel the, the federal government um, um, made a fairly big mistake in the way that they worded um, uh, C-18, uh, if they gave you a choice of would you like to spend hundreds of millions of dollars uh, subsidizing uh, not only publishers but broadcasters of all sorts, some of which don't even do news, or would you like to just block their content and pay nothing, I think most people would choose the same thing. Weedmark points out small publishers often didn't get money from the federal government for ads, but the feds did pay for ads on Facebook. He hopes Meta and the government can sit down and resolve their differences. The provincial government has agreed to some changes for next year's election, but using electronic counting machines isn't one of them. The head of elections, Saskatchewan, made several recommendations to modernize provincial elections. It was then up to a committee of MLAs to decide what to do. The Saskatchewan party members rejected the idea of introducing vote counting machines. Minister Jeremy Harrison says the government is concerned about integrity and wants people counting the votes. Tabulators are used in Regina and Saskatoon municipal elections and in several other provinces. The province's chief electoral officer was able to use the vote counters in last week's by-election and says the feedback was positive. The technology increases the integrity of the process. Uh, and that's what we're moving toward. We're being, we're being methodical about what we're doing. We're being thoughtful about what we're doing. We're testing. We're using social scientific data. And we're, we, we want to move forward into a modern approach that allows broader access uh, to voters across the province. 
The opposition says the government's concern about vote counters is not based in fact or logic. The committee did approve moving from advanced polling and election day to a voting week and expanding mail-in voting. A Saskatoon city councillor has filed a lawsuit against the Saskatchewan Health Authority. Darren Hill alleges the SHA and five doctors were negligent and failed in their duty of care when he was hospitalized two years ago. Hill says in March 2021, he was held at Royal University Hospital against his will. While there, he says doctors failed to adequately examine and care for him and failed to correctly diagnose his medical issues. None of these allegations has been tested in court. In a statement of defense, the SHA denies all of Hill's claims. It says the doctors acted appropriately as Hill was experiencing a manic episode and he was brought to the hospital amid fears he could potentially hurt himself. They say Hill was released once he was treated and his symptoms had improved. The Saskatchewan Rough Riders are back to the friendly confines of Mosaic Stadium this week as they welcome the BC Lions. This is the official halfway point of a season that's been rough on the Riders. They're sitting at 4-5 and five and slugging it out for that final spot in the, in the playoffs for the West. A bright spot, they may get one of their key players back soon. All-star receiver Kean Schaefer-Baker has been practicing with starters. It's been long and a, a lot of work and something you just got to be diligent with and just taking it day by day. That's, that's the biggest thing. People like to look far down in the future and that's not even promised. So it's just taking one step at a time. Well, he's practicing, so we'll see how he does and see how he looks by the end of the week. Twenty-seven. The Riders will be looking for revenge for their week seven loss to BC at the end of July. The Lions won that game 19-9 with Saskatchewan unable to score a touchdown. It's a 5 p.m. start on Sunday at Mosaic Stadium. With temperatures hitting the 30s in many parts of the province, it was a great day to head down to the river in Saskatoon. We spotted swimmers, cyclists and plenty of people walking in the area. What will the weekend hold? Weather specialist Ethan Williams brings us the full forecast after the break. This weather update is brought to you by Mercedes-Benz Regina, proud member of the Capital Automotive Group. Weather specialist Ethan Williams joins us now with a look at the forecast. Heat, wind, smoke, is there anything else, Ethan? Uh, I'm running out of breath, Natasha. There's just so much to keep an eye on as we head into the weekend here. Let's start with the heat and uh, the temperatures. Boy, they are still hot in south-central and southeastern Saskatchewan, low to mid-30s right now. But you notice this cold front moving through here. Look at that Kindersley just sitting at 16 degrees. There's uh, basically more than a, uh, you have to cut the temperatures in half in southern, extreme southern Saskatchewan to get what they're getting right now in west central Saskatchewan. And as a result of that cold front moving through, uh, we have seen some heat warnings in effect for the Swift Current and Leader and Gull Lake areas come to an end. Those are still in effect right kind of along the uh, very far south of the province. Should also note we have air quality advisories that are in place for all of southern Saskatchewan now from those fires in BC and the Pacific Northwest of the U.S. And of course, we have air quality advisories for the fires in the Northwest Territories in northern Saskatchewan. Air quality health index expected to be moderate to high levels, likely especially tomorrow, but potentially through the weekend, especially in southern Saskatchewan. Now, what will be helping things a little bit is this rain moving in from Alberta uh, and a little bit of some spotty showers along the southern border of the province as well. And that rain going to continue overnight. But there's that cold front that's going to keep bringing in that smoke from northern and western sections of the country into the province as we head overnight tonight. And again, rain starting to get heavier as we head through the overnight hours. Temperatures much cooler tomorrow, especially in the south as that cold front passes us by tomorrow. High pressure moving us in, draw, or moving in, dropping those winds for us as we head through tomorrow. Also clearing us out. But Sunday, another system from the state starts moving in, bringing rain to southern Saskatchewan. Now, this first system overnight tonight could see pockets of 20 to 30 millimeters in the northern grain belt, specifically in western sections, Lloydminster over to Prince Albert. And then as that system rolls in Sunday through Monday, 
southern Saskatchewan could see a good 10 to 20 millimeters. And keep in mind, this model ends at about 6 o'clock Monday, and there will likely still be rain moving in after that, and potentially even to central Saskatchewan on Tuesday as well. Winds picking up gusty tonight again from the northwest is where we're seeing them bringing in that smoke. Tomorrow morning and for the first part of the day could be as high as 60, maybe 70 kilometers an hour in Regina and the southeast. High pressure moves in Sunday, though, and that calms us down a bit. They pick up a little bit in anticipation of uh, that system moving in on uh, Sunday in southwestern Saskatchewan. This is just how much those temperatures are going to be dropping when you compare daytime highs today to tomorrow. Some 10 to 15 degrees through southern Saskatchewan. We are really going to uh, notice a big difference. And there it is right there, Regina, sitting at just 21 tomorrow. Gusts, especially in the morning, could be uh, quite high. Sunday for the Ryder game, looking uh, still not bad. That's the one day that's really held up this week. And then uh, Monday, the rain comes through. Still a chance of it on Tuesday. We'll see the backside of that system. And then as we head through Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, temperatures uh, kind of evening out a bit. We'll likely see some sunshine in there as well. Well, for Saskatoon, again, we may not even crack 20 degrees tomorrow. Still quite rainy uh, at times, potentially, but then clearing out. And then again, especially Tuesdays when we'll see that system moving through for you. But then the sunshine comes back on the other side of that, Natasha. Okay, I think I've covered it all. <laughs> there we go. That is certainly hard to follow. Well yes. done, Ethan. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll be back after the break. Stay with us. When it comes to your news, we want up-to-the-minute access. Anytime, anywhere. Get the facts straight from the source. Download the free CBC News app or visit cbcnews.ca for news you can trust. When a storm rolls in, most of us run for cover, but some thrill seekers go looking for troubled skies and increasingly those storm chasers are women. Ethan Williams has this story. Jenny Hagen clocks thousands of kilometers a year chasing all types of storms from severe weather in the summer. This is Jenny Hagen coming to you from Hodgeville, Saskatchewan right now. To blizzards in the winter. And her inspiration for chasing? It's backfield, it's not due yet. The character Dr. Joe Harding, a storm chaser from the movie Twister. It came out when Hagen was growing up near Kindersley. We would get tornado warnings every second or third night. So I would, you know, rip out with my pedal bike to the end of the block, to the edge of town, and just hoping that I would catch a tornado coming down, like Joe in the movie. There are many women like Hagen who storm chase in Canada, but she says it doesn't always seem that way. We're just a little bit quieter. And most often you see uh, the male versions on TV. So you look at the show Storm Chasers and stuff like that. They're very male dominated. It's why Hagen started a Canadian chapter of Girls Who Chase, a U.S.-based organization that empowers female chasers to put themselves out there, trust their skills, and network with other women. It's the brainchild of Jennifer Walton, a chaser from Colorado. She realized female chasers don't always get the credit they deserve, especially when posting storm content on social media. My male chase partner would sort of get, you know, patted on the back uh, just for being there and a ton of engagement and sales requests and I would get nothing. Now with thousands of followers on social media, Walton's organization offers training sessions for aspiring chasers. The Canadian chapter now has around 100 members, including Jacqueline Whittall. Beautiful tornado here. A meteorologist with the Weather Network, Whittall used to work in Saskatchewan, and it was while she was here that she began storm chasing. She says girls who chase is important because women have a unique way of working together. You're trusting your life with these people that you're with in the car. When you've got another woman in the field to relate to, there is a different kind of bond that you have just naturally with, with woman to woman. Meanwhile, Jenny Hagen hopes to inspire the next generation of female storm chasers, like her teenage daughter, who joined her during last summer's very active storm season. She looked at me and said, I thought you said tornado chasing was hard. <laughs> so, you know, she's had a boost of confidence in her skills, so I don't think she's uh, ever going to let that go. One more girl who chases, 
And for Hagen, the sky is the limit. Ethan Williams, CBC News, near Bullier. And our storm chaser, Ethan Williams, is back with one last look at our forecast. And how many storms to chase now, uh, Natasha? Too smoky for that, especially tomorrow morning in Regina. 15 degrees, those winds out of the northwest, close to 60 kilometers an hour. Likely that air quality health index is going to be again into that moderate to high level, even as we head through the afternoon. Winds dying down a little bit as we head through the afternoon. Uh, probably as we get to about the mid-afternoon, early evening, we'll start to really see those winds die off. Saskatoon, we're seeing showers overnight potentially. We could see a few even by the 8 a.m. hour. Quite breezy as well for you. But then that all clears out and the smoke moves in and we're looking for winds uh, to diminish hopefully through the day as well. Now, of course, as you heard, the Rider game is on Sunday at 5 p.m. And uh, we're looking at uh, mostly cloudy skies. Could be showers starting to move in by the end of the game. So maybe taking the uh, rain gear with you, Natasha, and looking out for that smoke as well. Sounds good, Ethan. Thank you. You're welcome. Wedding dress shopping can often be long and stressful, not for this family. They've been passing down the same wedding dress since the 1950s. As of last month, it's been worn by five members of the same family without alterations. We caught up with the most recent bride to hear more. This is my grandmother's dress. Uh, she wore it in 1957. Um, she bought it from a store in Saskatoon on 2nd Avenue. She's not totally sure the store but she went with her mom to buy it and um, yeah fell in love with it the very next year her sister wanted to wear the same dress so she wore that um, and then in the 80s my auntie Leslie wore it and then in the 90s my mom wore it and then now me my grandma's sister wanted to wear it just because I think it was just so close to my grandma's wedding it was convenient and beautiful my auntie the next lady to wear it. She wore it because it was my grandparents' 25th wedding anniversary. So she thought it would be kind of a nice way to celebrate them and their marriage. My mom claims she's less sentimental <laughs> and wanted to wear it because it was there and beautiful and she tried it on and she loved it. And I wore it because I always just grew up knowing of this kind of trend that's been forming in my family and I just thought it was beautiful too. This dress has just kind of remained on my mind and it's remained pretty timeless and I I think even with today's trends it just it's just so classically beautiful that um it just kind of worked worked perfectly with kind of what I always imagined another crazy coincidence I guess you could say is that this dress fit so many different body types yet fit us all beautifully and comfortably I definitely did like a try on before and was kind of I guess pleasantly surprised to see that it fit me too and um, it was comfortable. We just had minor fixes with little, you know, buttons falling off here and there, but besides that, no actual alterations to the dress itself has been made since 1957, so it's, yeah, pretty awesome. <laughs> it's a special thing to be able to, to wear and enjoy your mom's wedding dress, let alone like your grandmother, so it's really cool and to be like the fifth woman to wear it is definitely an honor. The dress is open to anyone in our family to wear it. It doesn't necessarily have to be my future daughter. We know that we have cousins in the family who are open to wear it as well. And um, we hope that the tradition continues, of course, and um, hope that it remains just timelessly beautiful and um, that more women in our family would just be as honored as I was to wear it. And that's a wrap on this week. We believe that you should be able to find the news you're looking for wherever you are and whenever you want it. That's why you'll always be able to access local news, breaking stories, and the latest from around the world free on CBC News app and cbcnews.ca. Thanks for watching. Have a great night.